This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service Nebula. In 2010, a huge fight started brewing between China's two leading software companies. On the one side, there was Tencent, the behemoth behind WeChat, League of Legends, and more, who back in 2010 was riding high on their first hit, an instant messaging app called QQ. And on the other side was Qihu, the country's leading antivirus company, with their flagship app called 360 Safeguard. Both QQ and 360 Safeguard were massive hits in China, until in 2010, they finally finally grew too big to coexist peacefully. The problem started with Chihu blocking ads in the QQ app as a kind of cross-app ad blocker. Soon after, Tencent responded by developing their own competing antivirus software. They called it QQ Doctor and they bundled it with their instant messaging app, which got them 100 million installs almost overnight and a 40% market share in China right away. In response, 360's antivirus app quickly sent users a suite of pop-ups warning them that QQ software was basically malware that they should just stop installing. And not to be outdone, Tencent responded by basically blocking QQ from working on anyone's computer with 360 software installed, forcing users to choose either one or the other. Within days, this conflict spiraled out of control, the companies started to sue each other, and they took it all the way up to the Supreme Court of China. But perhaps most surprisingly, the Supreme Court of China didn't actually find either of these companies guilty of monopolistic behavior. Qihu versus Tencent was the first antitrust case in China's internet economy heard by the Supreme Court, and they decided that not only was the bundling of software and outright blocking of competitors' apps not against antitrust rules, but they even dismissed the idea that these companies had a dominant market position relevant to the proceedings at all. In other words, the Supreme Court took an extremely lenient approach, and that decision set a very clear precedent, making anti-competitive monopolistic behavior the rule rather than the exception in China's internet. In the following years, Tencent's WeChat routinely outright blocked links to competing social media apps, killing many competitors in their tracks. Retailers like Alibaba frequently told brands that they would have to choose between listing either on their platform or those of their competitors, a practice commonly called in China, choose one from two, and so on. For the last decade or so, China's internet became the Wild West, or shall we say, Wild East of monopolistic behavior, with the Chinese government doing very little to stop it at all. So it came as a huge surprise when in 2020, the government took a massive U-turn. A sudden and violent series of crackdowns started, in which every major internet company in China became targeted, hundreds of fines were handed out, legal systems were completely reformed, managers were fired or stepped down, companies were forcefully delisted from stock markets, and so on. The crackdowns lasted almost two years, and together with other recent economic difficulties, they wiped out at least $1.5 trillion in value from tech companies. That is four full Facebooks worth of market capitalization. Uh, I mean, four Meta's worth, of course. And after almost two full years of brutal crackdowns, everything kind of just recently stopped, almost as abruptly as it started. Just a few days ago, the IPO of Ant Group, the first victim of the crackdown, was reportedly back on track again, and not long before that, state-affiliated newspapers started talking of government support suddenly returning to the sector as well. So as the crackdown seems to be coming to an end, it's time to look back at the last two years and ask what exactly happened, why China decided to crack down on its own tech giants, and what they might have achieved in the process. The first signs of the crackdown were pretty well publicized across the world, starting with Jack Ma giving a now infamous 2020 speech in Shanghai. In it, he condemned China's financial regulators for holding innovation back by requiring tech companies like his own Ant Group to follow similar risk management strategies as traditional banks when holding money. He implied that it was an outdated idea that fintech companies like his should have to be as careful with money as banks, and that annoying government officials just needed to move out of the way. 
He must have gotten pretty cocky seeing how he was able to just brush regulators away in the past, but government officials decided that kind of challenging the entire financial system of a country would maybe be one step too far. Jack Ma mysteriously disappeared from public almost overnight after his speech, and when he appeared, he quickly stepped down from almost all of his roles at his companies and the elite business university that he helped found a few years prior as well. His fintech company Ant Group abruptly had its IPO plans canceled Sold, and his e-commerce business, Alibaba, soon received an antitrust fine of almost three billion dollars. That is the single largest fine of its kind by far in the history of China, and it's big enough that even EU officials would be impressed by the sum. And if there's anything that EU officials are familiar with, it's handing out big fines in the name of antitrust. Jack Ma's fall from grace was swift and decisive, and seeing the massive credit crisis in the Chinese real estate market that developed soon after, it's clear to see in retrospect that Jack's speech about loosening financial regulations must have sounded particularly dangerous to the government at the time. That said, while he might have started the avalanche, the crackdowns didn't stop with him at all. Every single major internet company in China was targeted, and the government pushed through major changes in seven areas. First, antitrust. China suddenly decided to crack down on those choose one from two and other similar practices it tolerated for decades. It got much stricter on blocking mergers that they deemed anti-competitive, they handed out hundreds of fines, and they passed much stricter anti-monopoly laws as well. Second, deceptive practices. Chinese internet companies were just as full of fake reviews, fake discounts, fake prices, fake well, just about everything, as they were of anti-competitive behavior in the past, and the government launched lots of investigations and handed out fines relating to those. Third, privacy. After decades of virtually unrestricted access to user data, the Chinese government passed the so-called Personal Information Protection Law, or PIPL for short, essentially China's own version of the EU's GDPR, which it is partially based on. This meant much stricter privacy laws, and the government also named and shamed 43 apps for illegal data collection, while even temporarily pulling some violators, like TikTok, from app stores completely for breaking these laws. That's pretty significant. Of course, in practice, people doesn't restrict government access to user data, but on the private company front at least, it does theoretically make it so that China now has clearer and stricter nationwide privacy laws than the US, for example. Fourth, labor laws. Chinese tech companies were famous for their 996 office culture, asking office employees to work from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week, with many leaders like Jack Ma not just openly endorsing such systems, but even calling it a blessing. Of course, the problem is that when your official policy is to make people work like 70 hours a week, every week, constantly, that's kind of illegal, even in China. And while the Chinese government in the past decided to not enforce those rules, they suddenly decided that maybe it was time to enforce those rules. Fifth, algorithms. New laws theoretically force companies to disclose to users when they use recommendation algorithms to push content to them and to allow their users to opt out of being targeted with such algorithmic recommendations. Sixth, financing and governance. In the past, most big Chinese internet companies listed their shares, or at least the shares of their shell companies in the US when they went public, which allowed them to raise money from mature international capital markets. China decided that it no longer liked this as it wanted to build up its own capital markets at home, so many national champions like Didi, the kind of Uber of China, saw massive investigations and crackdowns after going public in the US, which forced them and many others to withdraw. And not only has China made it clear that it wants companies to list at home going forward, but it also started demanding so-called golden shares in most internet companies like TikTok maker ByteDance or blogging platform Weibo, which would give the government a seat on these companies' boards with the power to veto future decisions. And finally, two problematic industries were singled out and, well, basically utterly crushed. Video games, as these were deemed to be too addictive, and after-school education, as this was seen to be putting 
putting way too much pressure on kids in China. No new video games or major updates were allowed to be released for almost an entire year in the country. The government limited playing hours for minors to just three dedicated hours a week and mandated that facial recognition and age restriction software was built into games to enforce these rules, while they also simultaneously outlawed basically the country's whole gargantuan after-school education industry as well to reduce pressure on school children, which bankrupted 25 massive online education companies and caused the collapse of the whole industry. Those seven combined restrictions had pretty wild effects on the country's internet economy, pushing most companies' stocks down at least two-thirds from their peaks in 2021, wiping out more than $1.5 trillion of value in the process and causing hundreds of thousands of layoffs. In other words, the government suddenly and deliberately wrecked the very tech giants that they in the past have basically protected at all costs, which really begs the question of why. What happened that made the government change so suddenly? To start with, Jack Ma's speech might have been the straw to break the camel's back, but the government has long felt that private internet companies were starting to amass too much power anyway, and much of the crackdown was simply a swift and brutal reminder to everyone in the industry of just who was in charge. But besides just the desire for more control, the government also faced threats, both externally and internally, that they needed to address. Externally, the US bans around Huawei, ZTE, and others made it painfully clear that China's economy and technology sector was dangerously reliant on core technologies from abroad. This was a major vulnerability, but according to the CCP, internet companies hoovered up most of the resources and spent them on pointless feuds that the government calls a, quote, disorderly expansion of capital around a million new ways to deliver food or shop online or whatever, instead of sinking their billions into critical capabilities around semiconductors, material sciences, self-driving cars, etc. These foundational technologies that China needed to gain independence or maybe even exert control over others in the future, these were not only not sanctioned, but actually continued to receive massive support, and the crackdowns partially served to make it very clear to everyone that these were the areas that the government wanted resources to be spent on much more. And internally, the Chinese economy, and through it, Chinese society as a whole, was reaching a pretty significant turning point as well. After decades of incredibly fast expansion, the country's growth started to slow dramatically in the last few years. Ignoring the crazy swings around the pandemic, a strong downward trend has become clear for everyone to see, even in the official figures, and with it, the sense of incredible economic progress has disappeared across China's population as well. In this environment, together with all the COVID-related pressures and other problems, citizens started to question what the long working hours, the lack of privacy, the brutal educational pressure, and the ruthless profiteering of companies were for when they themselves no longer saw great leaps in prosperity. Among China's youth, the phenomenon of lying flat has become increasingly popular, where people basically lose faith in hard work paying off at all, and simply switch to doing the bare minimum just to get by. I personally have Chinese friends of my own who subscribe to this lying flat idea, and it's just wild to me to see how people suddenly turn from kind of just accepting the hustle and working like crazy to turning their back on it almost completely. When the incredible growth stops, citizens understandably start demanding more of a focus on getting better consumer protections and working conditions, etc. And many of these changes and laws aim to signal to the population loud and clear that that's what the government is focused on now. Shorter working hours, less educational pressure, fewer scams online, etc. The government calls this a shift from a high speed to a high quality model for economic growth, and it emphasizes the concept of common prosperity. So that's why I think the government did it, to gain back control, to focus resources on what the government considers to be sensitive, critical technologies, and to further the idea of common prosperity. China seemingly compressed two decades of tech regulations into two years, so these changes seem exceptionally violent, and I think that is deliberate, as they attempt to send a very clear message to both the industry and their citizens that they take these things very seriously all of a sudden. 
Now the question is whether these consequences will work as planned and whether there are any unintended consequences. And while it's impossible to say for certain, we can already see some first signs. If you're interested in my assessment of the effectiveness of these sanctions, I've made a separate bonus video diving into exactly that, covering how government agencies, investors, consumers, and the markets have reacted so far. And you can watch that as a bonus video exclusively on Nebula. This video joins many other bonus segments that I've released on our own video streaming site called Nebula in the past, so interested viewers can dive deeper into each of my topics. And it also joins fantastic Nebula original series like China Actually from other Nebula creators like Polymatter. For everyone wanting to better understand how China works, which I guess is everyone still watching this video, I think this series is an absolutely brilliant resource. Nebula is built and owned by me, as well as hundreds of my very favorite educational creators, many of which I bet are also your favorite educational creators, and the platform truly significantly helps us finance our work while also giving you extra content to watch. There are no ads on Nebula, our existing YouTube videos are all up there as well, and new episodes often appear on Nebula Early Access, just like this very video, which launched on Nebula first as well.